BNT. Now after this, the only main reason for putting anything on it would be if you're trying to keep it clean if you're working. Much smaller, much easier. Yeah. Alright, that's it. Good to go. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks again. No problem. Well, ABSAR is Antigua Barbuda Search and Rescue. We're a volunteer search and rescue organization. We respond to at-sea emergencies when we receive them either directly by radio on VHF, sometimes by cell phone, um, sometimes even by email, and also the Rescue Coordinating Center in Fort de France, Martinique, will often call us up if they know of an incident. A lot more blood in it today. Um, APSAR is uh, a volunteer organization um, that is run entirely by volunteers. Mm -hmm. We have about a team of 15 or so, depending on the time of year. Jonathan has really taken it to another uh, dimension of search and rescue, which is the medical side of things. So we have this medic station here where people can walk in and we um, do minor uh, medical procedures here and uh, offer a lot of medical supplies to people. Uh, we mainly focus on wound management. Um, but then we also have an ambulance here and another rescue vehicle so we can transport people to the hospital. Um, and then we do firefighting. So uh, if there's a fire on one of the boats here. So we use the piercing nozzle through an existing hole cooled it down. We're now in the process of disassembling the battery, the problem battery. You good? Pull out of it, get it. Okay, you good? Slack. I grew up in Antigua. My parents moved here um, as missionaries when I was a kid. So when I started into emergency services, I always had the desire to come back to work in Antigua as a paramedic to help the people both in and around Antigua and Barbuda. I saw a sign on Bailey's door that said, um, perhaps our volunteers required. So I came in and saw Jonathan and uh, I said, you know, what do you want? And he said, well, what, what can you do? I said, well, sign me up for everything and we'll see what works. Before even think about to go to uh, to the doctors in town or before go to the hospital, we I always call Jonathan because uh, he, it's amazing. He really knows his stuff, and uh, actually he saved my husband from basically have to amputate his foot. <laughs> but if we're doing it for people to um, do their hands on their way out and or on their way in. Yeah. I think it's going to be more for people. More for visitors. For visitors would be, I don't know, that would be yeah. my initial thought. Because we tend to just wear gloves and then we wash our hands. Yeah. Oh, the one there with the... Yeah, but even if you get these two, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. I'm just doing the inventory. It's time to do Sunday Monday. Yeah? That works better for me because I'm really busy on Saturday night as well. Then I kind of be and, and a, yeah, and, and the weekends is um, you know when I do have time. Yeah. Monday it'd be a little bit awkward, but then we just have to deal with. Well, it. we'll swap at some point on Monday. Sometimes it gets quite hectic. I can be 
busy with my restaurant, working on a night time, you know, plenty of customers in, just finishing work, dropping the staff off. I get back maybe 11 o'clock at night. The next thing I know, I get a call out and I can be going out on the rescue boat till three o'clock in the morning. What? Didn't have the um, seals good, huh? Okay. Who knows where I'll be at Christmas? Ah. Well, what we like to do is always keep in the bow of the boat, into the swell, into the wind, or into the greater of the forces. So that buffer zone is where you're setting yourself up and setting your crew up to make sure everybody's on the same thing. Start with side pickup. It's just not one person driving the boat, it takes the whole team. And sometimes that's not an easy thing. Communications is never easy. If it's a, between a crew or between two boats, uh, it just doesn't come easy and it takes practice. And, and that's why we emphasize the communications on the boat uh, throughout the training. This is our going to be our tow rope. Really? It's not, but we're just going to use it to demonstrate. search and rescue so if uh, somebody is lost at sea and if you're out on a boat and something happens if you lose your engine or if somebody falls overboard or something happens on the boat um, we can send boats out to go and try to rescue you and try to find you uh, but we can also help coordinate air and search and rescues as well from airplanes and from helicopters When we do rescue people out at sea, I've been on one rescue where these three guys were found, you know, and they were found in this little life raft. And it, it, when, you, when you go out on a search and rescue at sea, it's like looking for a needle in the haystack. You know, it is, you're, you think the chances of finding anybody are, are slim, but we do, we do manage to, to find people. So. Uh, there, you know, there are those memories where, you know, like the, those three guys standing in their little life raft and they're like, oh, we're here. And it's just like, wow, okay. You know, it's very rewarding. And you think, oh, okay, you know, an hour before finding them, I was thinking, God, we're never going to find them, you know. See, you see your direction, yeah? Right, you're good. You're good. That'll be for the way. Okay. Yeah, I know it's uh, founded by uh, our friend and fellow director, Julie Esty, in 1998 and it was um, a young guy called Inigo Ross who went missing on a Hobie cap with his girlfriend. He was island hopping between the islands and uh, 
they'd gone into trouble. Um, Julie tried to get search and rescue assets organised to go out looking for them. By the time we heard about it here in Antigua, we generated a bunch of pilots to go down with our airplanes. And I was a pilot at the time. So, um, so I went along with a friend of mine and we went down and we searched for two and a half to three days, uh, looking all over. And we never actually found them or any remnants of the, of the boat. So coming back, it was a very difficult time because they were friends and uh, we used to paraglide together. And um, I just remember flying back in the airplane and just realizing that this is crazy because there was no organized search and rescue effort. Um, there wasn't any in St. Lucia and there certainly wasn't any here. So we did the best that we could. Uh, we had several aircraft up there, but again, we weren't really sure on how to conduct search patterns and what altitude that we should be at and all that. So by the time I got back here in that three-hour flight, I just uh, it was so clear to me that something had to change and we had to we had to do something. So um, within the first week or so, I started making plans to start Absar and came up with the name Antigua and Barbuda Search and Rescue. Pull that line down right here, no the other side. Pull. See how it comes out of my hand? I take it and I'm still working back here. Okay. That, that, excuse me, that, that won't play out. No, it will not play out. Let me show you something. This line won't pay out. Remember, there's our half. As soon as I go right here, it's not going to go nowhere because this line, since I'm working here, you're going to kind of do a dip. Generally speaking, the, the best quality of any volunteer is simply reliability. Somebody who's ready, willing, and able to be there when necessary to help get the job done. Um, all of us have different skill levels of what we're more comfortable doing and what we're better doing, and some people are better at some tasks and some not so much. And that's fine because there's all kinds of jobs out there that need to be done, and it takes a combination of the skills to make up the team to get the job done safely and effectively. I would say I've probably been volunteering for ABSAR for approximately maybe nine years. The day after I qualified as an EMT, my first call the day after was to Pigeon Beach to a man who'd been pulled out of the water. Um, we don't know if he'd had a cardiac arrest and then drowned or whether he drowned and then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, passed away from there, I don't know, but it was full on cardiac, first call out, on the beach, blazing hot sun, you know, nobody around, and I'm there doing CPR on this guy who was probably late 70s, early 80s.
breath. Do it well on the M30 M2. blood everywhere, there was vomit here, there was feces there and everything like that. That, that, that aspect really doesn't bother me at all. Um, and largely also because it's just been my nature, it doesn't bother me, simple as that. Some people get um, upset and justifiably so when somebody dies on you. Or, or, or you're involved in their in their death, and again that doesn't really bother me that much either. One reason is I, I as soon as I've finished with a case or I've finished with a patient, I do put it out of my mind. And um, people ask me, well, how many times have you done CPR, or have you, have you been involved in in an incident where you've done CPR? And I have to stop and actually take a long time to think about it because I don't keep count. And I, and I think that's an important. It protects myself. There was one case where um, it did get to me a little bit, and that was uh, a young man um, who was 16, uh, and he drowned. Um, I knew him very, very well, and um, I knew his parents very well, and he was actually playing with one of my sons at the time in the sea when he drowned. So that one, it did upset me for a while. But this is where your training and where your uh, knowledge comes in. Um, because I am confident that, we, that I personally and we as an organisation did everything we possibly could. We didn't, we didn't make any mistakes which caused his problem.